I Are we going sugar milk before sugar the last milk. before the last question? <laughs> I want to okay. try this sugar milk. Maybe you should top it off because it might. Oh be yeah, yeah, yeah. I a got a little bit warm. I got plenty. <laughs> Mine got a little bit warm. You don't want warm milk? You're not a kitty cat. <laughs> I went on, to I went to vintage just before coming here because. Let's talk about your serving vessel too. By the way. Oh my god! Straight it's real, looks like a pickle. It's real back of house vibes. It's like for those who don't know this, like if you don't know people who work in restaurants. We drink everything out of deli courts. Yeah. Like, the only way I can measure Thanks, volume buddy. is in deli courts. Ugh. I'm a little scared. The cooks will a, truly hate this. In a good this. way to try this. Every Cheers. time, Cheers, every time a new person tastes sugar milk, they just hate it so much. So, thank you for So, this doesn't me. have coffee in it? No, it does. Oh, That's okay. the whole thing. That's the whole thing. I don't hate it. No, I know. It's just like a simple... Yeah. It's like what a baby would choose if they were addicted to caffeine, which is like my palate, basically. <laughs> That's a great way to phrase that. So, how much sugar is in sugar milk? Five percent by weight. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess six percent in this one. Yeah. So. That's really good. It is really. Thank good. you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marco, Chloe, it Alex. It tastes like a sweet All of you guys, latte, they said it's very basically. good. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's. It's like yeah. Cafe Au like in Japan, the little vending machines. That's what this is modeled off of. It reminds I me of a Lait. colder, oh, like a colder Cuban coffee. So the, the, those of you who do not know, they do have vending machines in Japan. Fucking that everywhere. That are just out on the street. And you can get the sh- sugar milk in a can uh, that uh, is either hot or cold from the vending machine. Yeah, which is wild. You can go hot or cold? You can yeah, they have hot, hot vending machines. Cold. Wait, hot can? Hot yeah. can. And they are amazing okay, on, when it's cold outside. As in like room temperature? Out. No, no, no. As in hot, hot. Warm. Like, How do they like, do that? The, the whole vending machine, it's just like air conditioning or the, the, the cooling. Yeah. Half they, of it's they, heated, they half heat, of it's... Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And it's great because on like a... I remember walking down the street, coming up to one of these vending machines, and it's 12 degrees outside. You buy the can of, of hot coffee, and you... You warm yourself you're, up. You oh, warm yeah. yourself up. Yeah, that thing comes out of there, 130F. It's like, oh, grabbing it. Just, <laughs> and oh. then it's a liquid that's so sweet. Yes. It'll make your head spin. Mm. Yes. It's actually sweeter than this. Oh, yeah, by a lot. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty sure... I don't want to call this the healthiest drink that anyone would like, but it's actually not <laughs> it's that not. unhealthy. <laughs> it's just milk with some sugar and instant coffee in it. Yeah. All right, I'll ask my last question as you're continuing to drink, and then you can ask the last question. I, I, I will keep drinking. Do it. Um, so I, I asked you earlier like if you, if you thought Tulsa's palate had changed since you started... Not, and not just you, but since <clears throat> yeah, yeah. some places have started rolling out unique flavors and stuff, because mm-hmm. I think most people view Oklahoma as steak and potatoes, and yeah, yeah. you know Tulsa and Oklahoma City in particular are not that. There's a lot of good ethnic food and just different food yeah, in those yeah. cities. I'm curious where you see the food scene going in Oklahoma, mm-hmm. and do you think it's something that will attract... I know Tulsa does the whole work remote thing, and people are coming in from around the country. The cost mm-hmm. of living is great here, mm-hmm. but do you think at some point it will be, yeah, the cost of living is great... You know, I, I did the work remote thing, but then also the f- food scene there is incredible. Like, do you see it being something that <clears throat> will put Tulsa on the map just by itself, the food scene? Mm. That's a good question. So, I mean, I, I don't know whether this is an optimistic or just realistic view about how, like, markets change. Yeah. But <clears throat> I'm pretty suspect of people who are like, you know, we tried this really ambitious thing and Tulsa just isn't ready. I think I equate that to teachers who are like, yeah, I taught it so well, but my students just didn't get it. <clears throat> it's like, well, then you well, didn't then you teach didn't, it well. Well, then you yeah. didn't teach it well. So if your students don't understand, you didn't teach it well. So like, I mean, admittedly, compared to like San Francisco, Tulsa does not have as progressive of a food market. Correct. But I guess I don't see that as like a thing the, the way I see that changing is people who say, okay, so I'm not just going to like transplant San Francisco concept exactly as it is or New York concept exactly as it is because like part of the work that needs to be done is a mixture of you have to make great food, first of all, like every time. Mm-hmm. It's a little maybe <clears throat> even unfair, I would say, that like restaurants, the expectation is you're hitting every single time. Like if you're a teacher, you don't, you don't absolutely kill it every single lesson. Like you have tutoring, you have whatever. There's no like, there's no reconciliation session when someone has a bad meal. You're like, you know, this, we miss this thing. It's like they just come in and if it's bad, they're like, I hate it. 
Anyway, so that's one, <laughs> that's one thing is you just have to get the food right. But then the other things are like the storytelling and the relationship building. A, I think that's a beautiful vision of the future that like I've only just met you within the last year. Mm-hmm. But to say like, so here's my food. But instead of saying it's a fried chicken rice bowl to say like, well, these are all the things that are in it. But also this is why it's important. This is how people typically eat it. This is why it's a lovable dish that deserves a place like in this broader multicultural sort of context. So like it's almost more about teaching. Mm hmm. I think so. That's interesting. So I actually yeah. think that like food overall is like food overall. I see it as the challenge is not like can people cook well because like like Idaguense, restu- the this restaurant called Idaguense out at Eleventh and Mingo, like they have the best some of the best food you can buy with money in Tulsa. By You're gonna have to text me the name of that restaurant. I absolutely yeah. will. <clears throat> but I had never heard of Eleventh and Mingo. Eleventh and Mingo is called Idaguense. We I like just tasted it this last year. And I was like blown away. And the thing that's like hard about that is realizing that like they are cooking food better. And this is like no offense to like most restaurants around where I live, but like they are blowing people out of the water. But the issue is if the only people you serve are the people who already know that food, from everyone else's perspective, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Like from all of our perspective, it's like, oh, Tulsa's food scene just doesn't have any really good barbacoa like i wish i could live in philly and eat south philly barbacoa it's like you do realize we do already have that but me as a chef who's obsessed with food i only just found this like a month ago or two months ago i've lived here since 2013. so i think like that aspect of thinking about part of your job as a chef who like wants to be a part of the future or like wants a better future is to not just say like i'll cook good food and if people don't like it then tulsa sucks people didn't show up blah blah like all these ways of just making excuses for Mm -hmm. like people just not knowing like what you're doing um i think if you find like right now i feel really lucky to be a part of a group like so basically the kitchen of vintage like our team of eight i would say we're like very committed to that project of like mm, sort of explaining and teaching and welcoming people into what we really think is like hopefully a good inclusive future for food. Um, I feel lucky to be a part of that group because I do think if you have enough people doing that, then there's no way not to like everyone likes to feel welcomed. Everyone Mm -hmm. likes to eat delicious food. Everyone likes to learn new things about new cultures. So I think if you find a group of people who say my job is not just to make good food, my goal is not just to make money off of like rich people who want to spend money, but really like I want to build just the whole thing, the stories, the community, the food, then like it's, it is for me sort of whoever does that first or not mm. whoever does that first. But you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. if you find a community, people do that. There's no way that that doesn't happen in the community where like cool things pop up, like new interesting things that feel really good. Um, so yeah, I mean, because I have dedicated my life to it, I feel confident that it'll happen because I believe in myself 100%, basically. I love that answer. That, I kind of went into dreamy, dreamy world <laughs> right there. That was a really great answer. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, man, the, the, you brought up a really great point of um, just being curious is sometimes um, a great way to learn what your city is actually doing because yeah. you know i didn't know about that place on 11th amigo it's, and you're gonna have to say yeah. that name and it's a barbacoa place it's or? a barbacoa place you, you got the so lamb barbacoa I'm, I'm, it is I need, I need to know and so but i'm also i'm i'm a I'm foodie by heart i make alcohol for a living and i have never heard of that place and i i think that that's you know it i think our city needs to learn how to uh communicate what is actually going around because Mm -hmm. i think that there's a lot of people out there that would be interested in barbacoa just like myself yeah and uh like me sitting here with you i didn't know that you were making japanese breakfast once a month where if i would have known that i probably would have showed up a year ago yeah so um i I wonder I, i don't have the answer this is a question for everyone out there I wonder how a city can actually learn because these companies can't, you know, spend a, egregious amounts of money for advertising. Well, hopefully, that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So yeah. So. So just listen every week. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so thanks for those tips. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. You got your uh, last question. I have. My Did last you memorize question. it? 
I didn't memorize okay. it. But no, before we of do course it, we not. have we have one more. You know me. I know. I was I'm kidding. A, I, so I'm a I'm a brewer. I look at recipes. I don't I don't memorize. How many them. how many brewing recipes have you memorized? I so I make the Kolsch more than anything else. Mm -hmm. I think I have the recipe. I I know I have the recipe memorized, but that's the only one. Colin, that's a great question for a chef too. How many times do you have to go back to your notes or to wherever you got a recipe from, or how many times is it just something that? Because I play around in the kitchen a lot, and then mm -hmm. I fuck myself. Because mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, how did I do that? Like, what was my ratios of this? I don't you even remember. Make notes. Yeah, I don't. And so it's like, I got to try to recreate that. That is a good question. Uh, most of the time, it's a recipe that I've memorized. Like, like most of the, almost out of, all of out of habit <clears throat> or just out of times you've done it. Uh, both. Okay. I would say it used to be a really unhealthy thing because I was like, I felt like I was starting late in food, but I would say I was very dedicated to being a good professional. And I was like, if I can just study recipes at home, and that means that when I show up at the restaurant, I have it all, you mm. know, all the way down. I'm just going to do that. Yeah, I've had some kind of crazy relationships <laughs> with work in the past. Um, but usually it's memorized. The only time I would cook by feel is during research cooking or at home. Okay. In a restaurant setting, I think that's a mark of like a bad professional to cook to cook by feel because it's totally unsustainable. Well, and right. yeah, you're all over the map on consistency of what you're throwing yeah. out. If you if basically yeah. if you work with other people, the the one exception would be if you work alone, if you're the only chef, like you're the only person who ever cooks and you're committed to being there every day, go ahead and just cook by feel. But if you have a kitchen of two or more people, I think it's totally unprofessional. That's a valid to like point. Cook by feel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, what are we drinking now? The last one. All right, one. so we are drinking Mrs. Stout. Uh, sorry, we're drinking Mrs. Stoutfire. You learned. Good I did learn. <laughs> you have to be right you up on the microphone. <laughs> so I asked everybody of the our first recording uh -huh. of what what I should do and how how the podcast sound. And everyone said, "Lean into the mic." It's a key. I'm learning. It's a key. Uh, so um, it is an imperial stout that we made last year in February uh, that we make with Arbol chilies. Oh. Um, and it is 18%. Holy so, shit. 18%? 18%. Right. You heard that, right? Let's go. Uh, amazingly enough, I chose a new yeast strain uh, for this round of Mrs. Stoutfire to test it out. The, the recipe changes every year, even though that I do write down my recipe um, <laughs> so that I can repeat it. Was that a shot at me? <laughs> no. <laughs> was, that a, was that a dig? I did make eye contact too much there, I think. You did. It was right at me. Uh, but, uh, so if anybody out there is listening, my original gravity, uh, of this, of this beer, uh, was the exact same as the year before. And we only had 14% come out, uh, the year before. And, but this new yeast strain actually ate the last, uh, it, it, it ate all the way down to only like one and a half percent. Oh, sugar. Wow. Oh, cool. Whereas so, it's, the, so it's like dry, but really it's a alcohol. very, very dry beer technically with a lot of sweetness mm. still there. And um, so the, the year previous, there was about nine and a half percent sugar still left in it. And, and this year's, uh, there was only one and a half. So there's a lot more alcohol involved. It's a lot. Um, and actually what transpired was I used less Arbol chilies this year and uh, it's been in the bottle for about a year now, um, so there, there, there's a little less heat from the Arbol chilies. Mm. But at the first, it came out a whole lot hotter yeah. than I was intending it for. But, but it was really cool. Well, cheers. Cheers. Cheers, cheers guys. <sighs> mm, I'm just going to live in that moment for a little live bit. Live in it, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my last question actually... Uh, ties beer, into buddy. thank you yeah thank you very much it's good there's a lot going in on it you served it like room temperature too was that on purpose uh, yeah so we uh, we keep this beer in our lab um, at 51 degrees so I just okay. actually pulled it from the box and uh, and and brought it here that's so. awesome but yeah the these kinds of beers need to be served at room temperature so yeah it just mm -hmm. lets the aromatics kind of blossom out of the out of the beer a lot easier yeah 
Um, so, excuse me. Um, <laughs> Happens when you drink. Yeah, <laughs> you're good. Uh, so my last question really ties into what we were just talking about. Um, so it, it, my last question is, how have you seen, what, what has your experience been, um, and you've answered this kind of within this conversation, but your experience personally as a creative in Tulsa, and how do you think your efforts have uh, really uh, uh, influenced those uh, in, in our community uh, about their thought process on food? So I would say one of the, so it's a, it's a part of our mission, like within this sort of group that we've made, which also it's really cool. Like we came together just since the beginning of the pandemic. Like mm. it's a very new project, I would say overall, but we're like very committed to each other. Um, I think one of the things that is like somewhat unique about us in this city, or at least that we're like sort of uniquely committed to is like, we want to tell our real stories. And I'm typically very skeptical. Well, I'm, I'm very skeptical of people in the food industry. It's like most of the time you're just like trying to make money, you know? Um, but I would say like, we're very committed to like telling our real story. Thanks, bud. So like, I know that it's easier to make money making sushi or so basically like raw fish and saying this is Japanese food. That's an easier way to make money than making like cold summer noodles. Like no one knows mm. what that is. Like when you serve that little noodles. so good. Yeah. When you serve yeah. noodles with ice cubes in it, like I had, and actually it was a very adorable thing. I, I guess will not, if this person hears this, they will know it was them. But someone, I, we made these summer noodles that have ice cubes and John tasted this. It's all these summery, crispy vegetables and ingredients. And uh, it has ice cubes in it because the goal is it's supposed yep. to be really cold. You eat it during summer. And um, this one couple who are very sweet and nice supporters were like, oh, so what is this? Is this like a gel or like a whatever? <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's frozen water. That's ice. ice. <laughs> ice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like they, they were like, oh, this must be some cool like yeah. transparent little whatever. But I was like, to be that's fair, ice. you did carbonate watermelon. I did carbonate watermelon. So to think that you would do something weird with ice is not too far out of the realm of possibility. Yes. yes. And by, by the way, the dis, dish that you're talking about, yes. ice cold uh, summer noodles, noodles. Oh. summer noodles is so my good. number one dish that I miss. Oh my God. Well, either I, yeah. I want that so bad. I will make it happen. We'll have to wait till it's summer again, but next <laughs> summer, right. absolutely. Yeah. I will. Make I'll, that I'll eat it in the winter. <laughs> Put snow in there. <laughs> All right. You're in, in there. Um, so the answer to the broader question is like, I know that some of the things we do are not the shortest path to like sustaining ourselves, like making a living, like it's an overall problem that people in the restaurant industry, especially like cooks, like back of house, like don't make enough money to like live a stable life. Um, at the same time that we're like trying to address the problem, like actually a big part of our mission is around like money equity, transparency, fairness, accountability around money within the sort of group that we have. Um, but the sort of broader point is like, we're very committed to telling our own stories, even if they don't fit that well with what people think they want. Mm. Like you think you want sushi, but that's because at some point someone's like, man, American people can understand sushi. Just go for it. And that's how people make money. And it's no, it's nothing against those people at all because like people need to make a living. But I would say the biggest thing for us is like wanting to sort of bring people into like what we actually believe is beautiful about food and drink and connecting with people. Um, even this idea that like, I don't think like for the most part, I really don't think that you should go out and be able to buy food for like less than $10, like at a restaurant. Cause in order to do that, you like kind of had to exploit someone. Mm. I like the idea that like, like part of the vision behind like this cooking course or teach me while I cook is like, if you know how to cook at home and you're not depending on like shitty restaurants to feed you for $4 a meal, then you eat for really cheap almost every day of the week. And when you go out, it's like go off, like drink great wine, drink cool cocktails, drink cool yeah. food. Like 
instead of it being like $20 every meal for takeout, it's like spend $3 a meal for every meal except for one and then go out and like really ball out, like spend $100 on a meal. Um, so I think like- I love that. Overall, yeah. trying to, overall trying to make that space where it's like, um, I guess ag acknowledging that like cooking, not just for me, but I think for a lot of like creatives within the food space, it's like something deeply personal and you kind of lose something if you just make it into the most popular product you can. You have to like toss out all these parts of yourself and if you just say, no, I'll just tell the truth as well as I can, but I'll supplement it with like the storytelling and talking to people and mm. making relationships that I think there, I do think that that space exists where people thought maybe it was impossible before to like do your real shit and have people really understand it and appreciate it. I actually think we're at a place where that is possible, you know, where people can really, you can make enough money to sustain yourself, but also like tell your truth mm. at the same time. I love that. I've, you know, at Cabin Boys really have uh, tried my best at to, uh, to support my production team who actually makes our product mm -hmm. and doing my best and to pay them what they're actually worth when, you know, that means that my company's not uh, necessarily making as much money as it could. Um, but that's really, really important. And um, I had a conversation with someone that wanted to be a brewer and I said, okay, so what, m one of my first questions was, okay, if, if you think that you're going to be a creative and work really hard to do this, the first question are, is for me is, are you ready to create something that someone is worth paying more for and going to put into their body and consume? Mm -hmm. And that that is uh, yeah. a really uh, interesting question and inquisitive to ask yourself when you are a creative and uh, making something that um, is worth someone's uh, uh, dollars to to actually invest in yourself and in, in you. Yeah, uh, that's making it. Mm. Absolutely. I now see how Joe Rogan podcast can go like three and a half hours long because I could just sit here. There's like more questions I could just keep asking, but I'm not going to do that to you. I'm going to let you go. It's a big old rabbit um, hole, yeah. Yeah, right. But before we leave, once again, the website for your cooking class, when they need to sign up by and when they can find you at Vintage. Absolutely. So Promote yourself. How, how to actually cook com. This is our first session. Um, Signups close on the 15th or whenever I think 16 will be the cap. It's like a live class. So like... I'll be there and there's weekly check-ins and everything. It's really like, I'll make you into a person who actually knows how to cook. That's a whole point. So like, it can't be an infinitely large class. You heard it here, folks. Yeah. <laughs> how to actually cook.com. The 15th um, signups will close. And then the 22nd is our first class. It's Fridays in the evening is like our time to talk about ideas. And then Mondays in the evening is our time to like cook together and see those ideas. Um, you get a bunch of gear, a knife, a couple books, a fermentation chamber, um, and then every week there's just like a focus on a different topic. And then, yeah, if you want to try our food, um, the easiest thing we do most of our like marketing or putting our message out on Instagram. So kitchen at vintage is the name of the handle. And then all of us are sort of a part of that. Yeah. Me, well, me, Marco, Alex, Bradley, Julia, Chloe, um, Noah. Oh my God. Sarah got it. Okay. There I was go. like, Oh Good God, job, don't Good job, <laughs> Sarah just joined us. I was like, don't stop on the seventh person. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, those awesome, are sort man. of our projects. Yeah. Well, cheers and thanks for coming in. And absolutely, I hope we asked some good questions. I feel like it was good conversation. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. was good. Really, th thank yeah. you guys for having us. Yeah, Seriously. cheers. Cheers, and trust me, go eat Collins food. Yes, yeah, I certainly will. Yes. Now. Well, thank you for listening, everyone. This is the tasting room. Are you going to toss a break, or am I going to toss a break? You toss it. All right, we'll be right back after this. Stay with us. And that is the talk with Colin and the consumption of my first consumption of sugar milk. And it, it was a great consumption. It was. It was a great conversation and great consumption. And just a fun conversation yeah. to have with him uh, and really get to know uh, someone who is extremely creative within our, our community. And I really do encourage you. I, I'm going to take his class. I encourage you to take his class if you're interested at all in cooking or learning how to cook or if you're like me and just want to know more 
I guess, solidify the building blocks that you yeah. already think you know about and, how to cook. And I think that I, I will probably be encouraged by my wife to go cook uh, <laughs> right, or, or right. learn uh, in his, his class because uh, it is not just for intermediate but beginners yeah. as well, such as myself, because uh, I'm scared of the kitchen but also could help uh, my wife cook and actually bring something yeah. to the table. Boy, you're going to have – it's <laughs> going to be great. You're just going to surprise her <laughs> if you take this class with meals galore. <laughs> She's going to wonder why. Why have you been gone on a Friday night or yeah, whatever right. it was? <laughs> What's happening? Yeah. <laughs> and then I'll no. be like, bam, bam, <laughs> eat my food. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> uh, no, but that was the fantastic stuff. Do you want to uh, clue our viewers in into who's – and listeners, into who's joining us for episode two, technically. Yeah, uh, so we're fortunate enough to have Elliot Nelson, uh, the man, the myth, and the legend, runner of uh, the McNellys Group, and uh, it's going to be a wonderful conversation with him. Yeah, because he is someone who has truly uh, influenced what downtown Tulsa looks like. It's not hyperbole to say he is the reason downtown Tulsa is what it is. It's <laughs> yeah, without I mean, an understatement, yeah. yeah. Uh, the downtown Tulsa wouldn't necessarily have a face without his right. efforts and his uh, visionary uh, uh, mindset of what Tulsa could be. Yeah, I'm very curious to see what he brings to the tasting room from a either food or beverage standpoint. Yeah, very curious. I love that Colin didn't bring food as a chef, by the way. Yeah, that was the, I, I love that. Yeah. So, he told me, he's like, I was going to bring a nice wine, but then I was like, anyone that knows me knows I drink sugar milk. He was like, so that's just what I'm going to bring in the that, deli court. Like, it was just that, fantastic. That's so great. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll bring the bourbon and beer, uh, and yep. I have encouraged Elliot, uh, and we'll see if he actually brings something uh, to, to his personality and what has influenced there it is. himself. So that'll be about a week or so from now. We'll have, uh, I'm going to call him Sir Elliot Nelson. I'm going to knight him. Tulsa. He, he needs to be knighted, yes. Tulsa. He is the knight of Tulsa. Yes, So he we is. will call him Sir Elliot Nelson. That is next week on The Tasting Room. Good show, buddy. Thank you very much. We'll see you guys next week. Right on.